and they lack that goodness, that's evil. Yeah, it's kind of a brokenness. You take a mm -hmm. good thing and you break it. I, I sometimes do this during a talk with an audience. You know, it's great if you have homeschoolers because I, <clears throat> I say, anybody here have a pencil? The homeschoolers got pencils, you know, because they're using them all the time. They're writing. So some young lad gives, <laughs> gives me his pencil. I'm on the stage and uh, say, is this a good pencil? What makes it good? Well, it does what it's supposed to do. I said, and then I break it in half in front of the audience and a gasp goes up, you know, and I said, now is this good? No, it's broken. It can't completely do as it was intended to do. Okay. By the way, notice that everything is still there. That's the pencil. It's just, it is just now configured in a way that it can't accomplish what it was intended to accomplish. So it's no longer good. And of course I thank the young lad and I give him his broken pencil. Back. You don't, you don't <laughs> have you know, a pencil redeemer actually, here? I think <laughs> give I, I have in the past. Um, I usually keep a pencil in case somebody doesn't have one and then I give them mine in return, but you know what? They're happy to have the broken pencil. They'll probably put it in frame somewhere, have the date to it, say, yeah, that was part of this thing. Anyway, but that's, I think it's a good illustration because it shows that, that the badness is not something that comes into existence, but it's a loss of some good capability. And notice visual, this too. explanation only makes sense in a theistic world. That's right. Because you can't you can't lose the way things are supposed to be if there's no way they're supposed to be. And you can't have no, you can't have a way they're supposed to be without his mm -hmm. bozer. <laughs> and everything, if, if goodness is being the way they're meant to be, being like God, reflecting who he is, you have to have that standard. You have to have, you have to have something we were created for. Exactly. You have to have a standard that we're measured against. That's right. None of this, I, none of this makes sense. How can evil be a deprivation if there is no standard? It's if not there's possible. there's no purpose, that's right. There, and this points to the issue of the universe being teleological, made for certain ends. And, uh, and by the way, this is also in our language. All health language is teleological. We know a thing is broken only if we know what it looks like when it's whole. I sometimes will ask, look at if you're in a desert somewhere and you, you, you come upon some contraption that you've never seen before. I guess it doesn't have to be a desert. Anywhere you come upon this contraption, how would you know whether the contraption was broken or not? You'd only know it was broken is if you knew what it was intended to do and it no longer did it. That's how you'd know. And so health, when we say sickness, we mean something is broken from health. We have an idea of what the human body is supposed to be operating like, and that's called health. And if we don't operate in that way, then we have sickness. Our health is impaired. We're falling short of that goal. Um, there used to be a sense that psychology was the same way. Now it's not that way anymore. Your mind and psych psyche wasn't made for anything. There is no such thing as psychological health, except for if you feel bad about something gross, we're going to help you feel better about the gross thing. That's uh, If you're dysphoric about anything, then now psychology is to help you to feel better. But uh, um, that's just narcissism, so that's not health. Well, thanks, Greg. We've got a minute left, and I want to use this time to encourage you all to send us questions. We're going to be doing a lot of recording in the next few weeks, that's right. and we need lots of great questions. I actually mentioned that you can go on our website. If you go to our broadcast page, you can send a question in um, and, or in our contact page. If you put on there, hashtag STRask, I'll know that it's a question for this show. Just make sure it's a short question. It has to be 280 characters, so make sure it's a tweet-sized question, because if we get longer ones, we won't use it for the show. But some of you have already been taking advantage of this, so I'm looking forward to getting more questions that way. And also, of course, you can send them on Twitter with the hashtag STRask, and we will hopefully get to your question. Sounds great to me. So thank you, everyone. We appreciate you taking the time to send us those questions, and we will see you here next time. This is Amy Hall and Greg Kokel for Stand to Reason. Welcome to another episode of Hashtag SDR Ask. And you know what, Greg? I just realized that we didn't comment on the fact that Brooke is now on our board again. Brooke is back. I thought something sounded different from like the button pushing on the music. It was just a little <laughs> more expert then. Hello, Kyle. There's Kyle. And he's gotten pretty good at it. Over There he is. He has. And we thank him very much for filling in while Brooke was on maternity leave. And now she's back. Yes, but Brooke has red hair and not a red beard. <laughs> which that, is, that's is, how we tell them apart. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Enough silliness. Enough silliness. All right. Let's answer a question from Ian. Will Christians be able to grow spiritually in heaven, or will we remain at the spiritual growth stage we are at when we die, go to heaven? And would you show the, the Bible support for the answer? Thanks. Well, it's, excuse me just a minute. It's, pardon me. It's speculative because there doesn't seem to be a clear answer on this. Um, I am inclined to think that our spiritual growth stops in heaven, at death, I should say. I think J.P. Moreland may disagree with me on this, but I think it partly because of something he said. He uh, pointed to the passage in 1 Timothy where Paul says to Timothy that physical exercise profits little. Okay, you want pump iron? All right, big deal. That'll help you a little bit in this life, but it's got a temporal benefit. Um, but godliness is a means of great gain, for it holds a promise not only for this life, but also for the life to come. Okay? We also read in Second uh, uh, Corinthians chapter 2, that, as Paul puts it, the famous weight of glory passage, for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory. 
So it is the affliction and difficulty in this life that Paul identifies as momentary and light in light of eternity. So to us it seems not momentary and not light. And indeed, when we read Paul's descriptions later on in the book of his own sufferings, um, it seems amazing he would describe it that way, but he's looking not at the temporal, but the eternal, as he describes in that passage, for the temporal is passing away, or the invisible is passing, the visible is passing away, but the invisible is eternal, something to that effect. But notice the thrust. The thrust seems to be, this is your opportunity to grow in a spiritual fashion, because the circumstances for that growth exist here in a fallen world. That's the second Corinthians 4 intimation. Momentary light affliction is producing for us. Well, we won't have affliction in uh, in heaven, and so that affliction will not be able to produce the eternal weight of glory. The weight of glory is accomplished this side of the grave. That's what it seems like to me from that passage, which ought to influence the way we look at our own trials. And uh, I, I think one of the biz- bizarre passages is in James, says, consider it all joy when you encounter various trials. Really? Joy? That's hard to do, unless you see it in the eternal perspective, as Paul did in Second Corinthians 4. That's hard to get our heads around, I realize that. But um, I think that the intimation is very strong there, that this life is the time for growth. Then we, we will be resurrected, and there are going to be different levels in a certain sense in heaven. People are going to be at different stages of maturity. They're going to be in different mansions. They get different crowns, different dwelling places, however you want to characterize it. The metaphors are mixed in the New Testament regarding this. And I don't have any intimation that we're going to be able to catch up with them. You know, John Newton's, man, he's way out there. And I'm down here, and he's in first class, I'm down here in steerage, right? Okay, well, I'm never, in heaven, I'm never going to get up there to where he's at, uh, I don't think. Uh, and this is why the emphasis is that we make the best of this life to grow in Christ, because our, our, our spiritual station, I think, is going to be somewhat fixed. By the way, those are all reasons for my view, and I have never heard any biblical reasons otherwise. That is a rationale that we'll keep growing spiritually. Now, I suspect we're growing our knowledge and our understanding of things, but that's not the same as... as spiritual substance, godliness. There's a, a sense in which when we are resurrected, we accomplish a, a, a kind of perfection that's native to the resurrected body and the resurrected self. But at the same time, it, there, it's clear that there are differences. And uh, greater rewards. Hebrews talks about the better resurrections, for example. Um, and so this intimates to me that there are different stations. Now, how do we make sense of that if we're all perfect? And the way one person put it as an illustration, which was helpful to me, is that... Um, in a certain sense, we'll all be perfect light bulbs. Some of us will burn at a billion watts and some at 10 watts. Some of us will be dim bulbs, but we'll be perfect dim bulbs, <laughs> so to speak. Think of it in First Corinthians where Paul talks about the, our judges, I'm sorry, our works being judged by fire. And a wood, hay, stubble will be burned off. And those with only wood, hay, stubble will escape except through fire. In other words, they're going to make it into heaven, but they're going to make it into heaven naked and smelling like a smoke, right? And that means they, they aren't going to have much that they're taking with them, having accomplished little on this end. Anyway, that's my sense of things. You are, I, your face is all screwed up I'm just up thinking very... No, I'm, <laughs> I'm ready to get it now. I'm thinking... I'm trying to think about this because one thing that makes it hard to answer is what what exactly we're refer, what exactly he's referring to because I think there could be a difference between rewards and spiritual growth because one thing we know is that our character is going to be made like Christ because there's, there will be no sin in heaven. So, and I'm thinking of 1 John 3 where it says... Um, We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. So that is what is going to transform our character. So I don't, that's, I don't think, I think that's not what's at issue here. But growing spiritually, I I do agree that there are certain things that we learn about God and we learn to appreciate about God by going through this life and going through suffering and learning to depend on him and to, to know his grace. And there are certain things that we learn about him that way that we won't be able to learn about him later on. But we'll also, we'll hear other people telling their stories. So I don't know that I I don't know that I can say for sure that there will be no growth. But again, what is meant by growth? Does it just mean our ability to appreciate God, our ability to love Him? It's hard to imagine that that not happening because just the nature of relationships, we grow in in our appreciation of the other person, the, the better we know Him. But I just think there are certain things that we can't learn about Him there mm-hmm. that we have to learn about Him here. So I suspect that could be something that doesn't increase there. Well, I don't think of it's pardon me so much in terms of um, content of knowledge because obviously that can change, but rather substance of character. Remember Paul's wording in First Timothy, but godliness is a means of great gain for it holds a promise not just for this age, but also for the age to come. So there is something inside of us that is a character of godliness, even though we might learn more. People learn a lot of things and don't become godly. Mm-hmm. And others may learn a little and, 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 and uh, develop a, a significant characteristic of godliness. Think of the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Well, these don't have anything to do with knowledge. These are character qualities. Now, our knowledge of God in the Bible and Scripture can abet those and help those to grow, but they're separate categories. And I've always tried to make the point, if you, you, it's one thing to look at a gifted 
person, a person who has spiritual gifts that may be very public and very, very effective, gifted speakers or teachers or somebody like that, do not confuse that with spiritual fruits because gifts and fruits are different things. And we can look at a person and we think, wow, that person is so great on stage and doing that. And I'm not saying that person may be disingenuous. I'm just saying that's different from spiritual fruits they might show in their, their life. And um, I, I mean, I'm certainly aware of that in my own case. I, you know, I have big gifts that people can see, but I also have a private life that I'm aware of regarding the production of fruit in my life. And, and the two are very different kinds of things. Let me just say it that way. Right. And I, I hope I didn't give the impression I just meant knowledge about God, but just the the experience of, of, of his faithfulness through things. I guess that's more what mm-hmm. I meant by learning about him. Um, as for the passage about godliness being great gain for the life to come, that could also just mean that this is something that's worthwhile because it's it, it will last. Mm-hmm. Um, but if that puts one person ahead of the other, which it seems like it could, it also means that when after the resurrection, the second person can catch up with the first. Well, what if everyone is increasing afterwards? Then they'll, they'll never catch up. But that doesn't mean we're not all increasing. Yeah. Yeah, There's really I mean, no way to know because it doesn't say. Well, here's, <laughs> here's what I take refuge in, in uh, re- regarding my own view. And I acknowledge that this is just a shot. I mentioned a bunch of verses that seem to suggest that there are certain kinds of growth that are meant for this life that can't be accomplished there. But I don't see any passages that seem to suggest the opposite. Mm-hmm. So I'll no, just that's go fair. the passages. That's fair. All right. Uh, here's a question from Sam in Australia. Considering heaven will be perfect, no tears or pain, will I be able to accidentally fall off a cliff, drop a rock on my toe, or step on an ant in heaven? Well, I don't, don't know. Don't you like all these step- speculative questions? Well, I'm just pausing. <laughs> step on an ant. What would be uh, imperfect about that? Well, it would be death. It would be for the ant, I guess. Well, if, if a person thinks that there is going to be no kind of any death, in a perfect environment, there's no death. That, a young earther's perspective would be that. Death is, all death is a result of fallenness. That's not my view. So I, I don't know I don't know why there'd be ants in heaven anyway, and there better not be any mosquitoes. I'm just saying. All right. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and what if it's a fire ant? Huh? And you're barefoot. Okay, so we just won't go to the ant thing. But regarding these other things, this presumes a certain physics, too. This presumes the physics of this world. And I have no reason to believe that, that the physics of heaven or the afterlife, because remember, it's not just heaven. Once we, we are resurrected and in our bodies, we are going to abide on a new earth that's going to be remade in some way. So I don't, I don't have any idea what the physics of the new earth amounts to. Um, so if we could fall off a cliff, maybe we'll just float to the bottom. Who knows? Or fly. I mean, that's certainly possible. I think the question is, can we be injured? And I think the answer to that is no. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Let's go to a question from Timothy Bayer. I've been doing some research on the dating of the Old Testament, and there seems to be a general consensus that it was written around 500 B.C. Is that accurate? And what resources do you recommend for further study? Well, this reminds you of a tactic we have in the tactics book called Rhodes Scholar. The key to this question is general consensus. I'm not sure what authors he's drawing on. Now, um, there is a, a general consensus about the whole Bible. And that is that the supernatural elements are not reliable. They, these didn't happen. These are fanciful additions at some point. There are historical elements in the New Testament and to some degree in the Old that might be relied upon. But for the so-called biblical minimalists, they're not going to trust anything in the Old Testament unless it's been corroborated by some other documents or archaeological information. So well, all I'm saying here is that um, scholars come to these questions with certain biases in place. And the, the, the road scholar tactic is meant to help us step around those biases by asking a question. And the question isn't, what, what does the headcount tell us, which is being referred to here, but what are the reasons that they hold their views? So we have a massive number of people that don't believe in the resurrection. Well, why don't you believe the resurrection? Is it because the historical evidence is not good in favor of it? Well, that doesn't turn out to be the case. The case is that they just don't believe in resurrections, and so they don't happen. And if resurrections don't happen, this can't be an accurate account. Now, something might have taken place. Maybe the disciples had a vision, or they saw a ghost, or maybe they probably wouldn't say that. They would say uh, they saw a a hallucination, right? And that's why they were willing to give their lives, because they were really convinced that the hallucination was Jesus himself. Okay, so that's a naturalistic explanation of these details we find in the Scripture that are meant to secure a worldview. Um, that is being brought into the text. So the, I don't know the scholars in view here when um, it seems to be the general consensus that the texts were written 500 years ago. Now, I just read through Nehemiah and Ezra. Okay, and Nehemiah and Ezra were about 500 years before Christ. Okay, I said ago, yeah. I mean, 2,500 years <laughs> I ago. I think everyone knows what you meant, yeah. Okay. So um, uh, <clears throat> roughly 500 years before Christ, okay? Well, there's a whole bunch of genealogies there. And the genealogies, it's striking. A lot of people will read through them and say, oh, no big deal, I'm just going to skip that chapter. <clears throat> but they were written for a reason. Hold on. <laughs> the reason that they were written is to give uh, homage to the people who worked hard to accomplish something. And so I actually read through them. Now I read quickly. But I want to, in my own mind, think, okay, these guys are here because they did something noble. I can at least glance at their names, all right? But notice, though, that these are records allegedly of real people. 
So that means there had to be a list somewhere of these names that they could put together and then record in these documents. And it's not just in Nehemiah and Ezra where we see those lists, we, in which, by the way, those two are one book uh, originally. They've been broken out. But so it was in, in there we have these records. But we have go back further and we have records. Numbers has a lot of that. Genesis has a record of genealogies. And at different places we see these genealogies. Am I to believe that 500 years before Christ people conjured up? all the details of the things that happened in the past with no written records, or uh, especially of genealogies. No, the fact that there's so much detail. The sons of Korath, 250 men of, of warrior age or something. Well, this is specific detail that they're giving. And, um, and so consequently, I, uh, it's hard for me to accept the idea that what we have is something that was written 500 years before Christ. In fact, I'm just thinking now for a moment. I think we have copies of the, 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 uh, yeah, the Pentateuch which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament that go back even before 500 years. I'm not sure, but, but certainly in a couple hundred years before Christ. So, it, um, I mean, this might be a line of evidence showing that these books had history long before that, which is why they were then translated in Greek eventually for a Greek-speaking world. can't give you the exact things on there, but there might be something in, in that, uh, the, the Pentateuch. Yeah, um, and the Pentateuch is the, the first five books. You said the Greek. Oh, you were, you were thinking of Septuagint. 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 Yeah. Sorry, oh, this yeah. is some senior moment day. Okay. <laughs> I know you know Penta, that. Great. Septa. I got my, my numerical prefixes mixed up. Okay, Pentateuch is the first five books, right? And the Septuagint. The Septuagint, which stands for 70, is the Greek translation that allegedly 70 Jewish scholars translated in Alexandria before the time of Christ. And we have very ancient samples of that that have survived. In fact, I was, at, I was actually present when one of those most ancient samples was unearthed archaeologically. Really a pretty cool thing. In, in any event, this, I, I don't think... My suspicion about the 500 years is that these, before Christ, is when the Old Testament was written, is based on um, a certain presupposition about the Bible, and that's what's driving this, and I think there may be reasons to think it's much older. Now, where would you find the reasons? I have only one recommendation that comes immediately to mind, and that's Josh and Sean McDowell's uh, newer release, I think a year or so ago, of um, uh, more uh, evidence evidence that demands a verdict. Oh, goodness. Uh, evidence that demands a verdict. And they have a whole section in there about the Old Testament, and there may be some answers in there. Yeah, and I, there's a book that I've mentioned um recently a couple of times on this podcast it's called the bible among the myths and he makes a point he he touches on this a little bit in there in that he um he says that it, it doesn't make sense to think that this entire change of worldview because he makes the case that uh, uh, how dramatically different the jewish worldview was from the surrounding nations very, uh, very radically different and he says you can only make sense of that by looking at how history created that understanding and he said if you say that they they made this up they developed this monotheism and just made it up at the last minute. He said, there's no explanation for it. There, there's no way to understand how it came to be, that people would just make this up. Um, and there's no way to understand that it would be accepted in the, in the society. Mm -hmm. So he kind of comes at it through that perspective, and I thought that was really interesting. So that might be another place where people could look. Yeah, that's good. Um, there, there is also, um, I think, a temptation to take something like the book of Daniel and late date it. Now, Daniel's during the same period of time, during, well, actually, 586-ish is when they the temple was destroyed, and that's when Daniel, as a boy, was taken away, but he writes later, too. So within 400 to 500 B.C., this is his era. And um, there are so many things that are in the book of Daniel that are clear prophecies of political developments that follow him. Uh, the Babylonian Empire, rise and fall, the rise and fall of the Medo-Persians and the Greek and the Romans in the time of Jesus. Um, that many people have just... Uh, just uh, in a knee-jerk way, late dated it because it reads like history after the fact if you deny the possibility of supernatural prophecy. So that may be another factor that's going on in here. All right. Thank you, Greg. And thank you, Ian and Timothy and Sam. We thank you for your questions. Keep sending those questions to us on Twitter with the hashtag STRask. And like I said a few episodes ago, we also welcome you sending those questions through our website as long as you keep it short. And it's the size of a tweet, which is 280 characters, I think now. So that is the one requirement, but we can, we can take your questions through there also. All right. Thank you for listening. This is Amy Hall and Greg Kokel for Stand to Reason. I'm Amy Hall, and you're listening to the Hashtag SDR Ask podcast. Amy, why are you <laughs> you're so happy today? You know, we, we talked about last the last episode that we're going to have video. Well, we're going to have to straighten up if we do that. <laughs> Sometimes Greg gets a little silly at the beginning of these episodes. All right, let's answer questions. How about that? Let's respond to questions. That's right. There it is. No okay. guarantees about the answer. All right, here's, here's a question from Anti-Neutrino. In Jeremiah 4.2, Jeremiah relays the Lord's message to Israel that Israel will be blessed if they swear to flee detestable things as the Lord lives. In what ways does this not contradict the command in the New Testament to neither swear by heaven or earth? Example, James 5.12 and Matthew 5.37. Well, keep in mind that that biblical commands reflect one of two things. They are always obligatory regarding 